Okay, I'm Kelly Hogan, and I am not at home right now. I am at a place that we're renting here at the beach for the week, and I just thought I would come in, and I had a few thoughts that came to my mind today. It might be a little random, a little rambly, but hopefully it'll make sense. I promise I'm going to try to bring it home to carnivore. If you're new around here, I do eat a totally carnivore diet. The only thing non-carnivore I have is I do put seasonings on my meat, and I still drink coffee in the mornings. Other than that, I eat only animal products. What does that mean? Meat. Fish, meat, pork, beef, eggs, some dairy. I do limit my dairy and that's it. That's it. The reason I do that is I was really sick and obese in my 20s and my doctor told me it was excessive carbohydrate intake that was making me inflamed. So I cut out all of the plants except for my seasonings and the coffee I quit eating all that processed sugary garbage, started eating meat, and now I feel great. Okay, lessons from the beach. Let me tell you a quick story about what I do every morning when I first arrive to the beach. I am a shark tooth hunter. We have shell hunters. Are you a shell hunter or a shark tooth hunter? Comment below. I think most people are shell hunters. I, on the other hand, will walk past a hundred beautiful shells. Do not care. I'm not picking them up. I might look at it and toss it down. Don't care because I'm here for the shark teeth. These are my finds just from the last, I don't know, 24, 48 hours. Nothing too impressive. I've been mostly walking, but I love shark's teeth. I don't know. I just think it's so cool that these used to be in a shark's mouth. It's slightly creepy, but also just amazing. I love looking. All right, when I get here though, what I, I like to do first is go downstairs to the beach and walk out and find a fellow shark tooth hunter. They're easy to spot. It's usually a middle-aged to older man, usually fully clothed. These people are not here for the water at all. We're here for the teeth. And they have their hands clasped behind their back, normally hunched. And they've got the look. They're bent over. They're not picking up shells. It's long time periods between they pick up anything. I go up to one. I'm trying to find my person, okay? And I walk up to somebody and say, hey, having any luck? Found any good ones? If I see a spark of, yeah, you want to see? And they pull them out. First of all, I like for my eyes to see what I'm going for. I want to see the shark tooth in someone's hand so that my brain knows this is this is what we're going for. Get the tunnel vision, Hogan. Right. Then I also, I like for that energy to be there. If I feel this positive energy where somebody is saying, yeah, you want to see? And they're excited to show me. I'm going to stay in their vicinity. Don't worry. I have etiquette. I've got manners. I don't stand too close. I give them their space. It's their territory. But I like to be nearby so that I can hear when they say, oh, found one. And I come run, running over. Oh, I want to see. And I like to show them mine. That positive energy feeding off of one another keeps us going because there are times when I'm out there where I find nothing for an hour or two. Nothing. And I'm very tempted to quit. But if I'm standing near somebody who occasionally is also saying, oh, look at, check this one out. Ugh, it keeps me excited and motivated too. And same for me when I find one, I go, oh, check this out. Great. I love that energy. If I walk up to someone and I say, you found anything good? And they go, no, nothing. It's like there used to be teeth out here. I used to find them when I was a kid. I never find any good ones anymore. Bye. <laughs> That's not the energy we're going for here, people. I don't need that negativity. The idea gets into your head. It's not going to happen. They aren't even here anymore. Hope is dead. No, we need hope to abound. So I look for the person who is having success, who is positive, who is excited. And then I stake myself out near that, that one. That's the one. Not too close. Just close enough. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, if you ever want to be a smoker, make friends with five people who smoke, you will be the sixth. Yep. If you ever want to be a recovered smoker, Make friends with five people who used to smoke, who have broken free. Hang out with them a while. You will be the sixth non-smoker. Yes, this is true. You want to be a great runner? Join a group of friends who they love to run. They're passionate about it. They're excited. You will also become a runner. 
which is hard to believe for me because I actually hate running. <laughs> but if that was my friend group and who I'm hanging with and they get excited about it and we have fun and we're going together and encouraging each other, it's possible. <laughs> it could happen. But if you want to be a successful, thriving, happy, healthy carnivore, find some, become friends with them, watch their videos, follow their Instagram accounts, hang out with them on Zoom, get to know people who are also excited about eating this way, and you will be the sixth happy, healthy, thriving carnivore. So one of the biggest tips to becoming good at anything is do it longer and with enthusiasm. <laughs> That's it. If you want to find a, a plate full of shark's teeth, do it longer. Just look for them longer than most people would with enthusiasm. You're going to find some. Well, I guess the biggest tip is you're going to need to be near the beach. I should throw that out there. You can look with extreme enthusiasm in the middle of, I don't know, Idaho, and you're going to struggle. I don't care how excited you are about finding these shark's teeth. But if if you're smart about it, you've got some coaching, somebody to at least say, hey, go to the beach, man, if you're looking for shark's teeth. And then you're you're dedicating a long amount of time to this and you're enthusiastic and you have other people around you who are also excited. You are setting yourself up for success. It's awesome. I had a lady this week message me on Instagram. I had posted a new like after picture, a recent photo. And she said, I wish I looked like you when I do carnivore thank you, right? Like, thank you. That's very nice. So I asked her, do you do carnivore? Are you a carnivore? And she said, yes. And I said, may I ask how long have you been doing it? And she said, I just finished two months. Now keep in mind, her comment was, I wish I looked like you when I do carnivore. I said, just for the record, I didn't look anything like me at the two month mark either, right? Like, <laughs> I was still an obese lady who was struggling and making mistakes and a, a still sugar addict who was having a very hard time just focusing on eating only meat. And I was having some success with weight loss, but I was nowhere close to this. I was still much closer to the 260 mark than the 130 mark for sure. So comparing your own chapter one with somebody else's chapter 42, not the same. Likewise, if I stand out there hunting for shark's teeth and I've been there for 10 minutes and I'm comparing my one little tooth to somebody's medicine jar full of them, that's ridiculous, right? But if I stay out there longer, keep going, I stay excited because of the people that I'm with, then yes, I will eventually get results. Okay, story number two. I'm going to take you back to the year. The year was 1954 when my mother was born, but that is completely completely irrelevant to this story. Just a coincidence. In 1954, there was a widely held belief that it was completely impossible. There was a barrier to running a mile faster than four minutes. It had never been done, never once documented. For those of you who don't know, the Olympics and Olympic records, they go back a ways. This is not a new thing, the Olympics. <laughs> and it had never once been documented. Any person running a mile faster than four minutes. And the medical community, as well as the scientific community, actually believed that it was impossible because of the conversion rate for oxygen and how fast human hearts can beat. And the belief was that a person could actually die if they ran any faster than that. So many people could get to the four to five minute mark and no one any quicker than that to the three to four minute mark that it was just declared that was impossible. You can't do it. Well, in 1954, a man named Roger Bannister, he, he was a young medical student and he had declared he did not think it was impossible. He wanted to be the first to do it. And sure enough, Roger Bannister did it. He barely did it, but he broke the record just under four minutes. The running world goes wild. News spread very quickly, but that is not the reason I'm telling you this story. <laughs> the reason is what happened shortly after that. So all of documented human Olympics and running, no one had done it. Then Roger Bannister in 1954 breaks that record. Then what? Lots of people did it. 
Lots of people are suddenly able to do it. Why? It was no longer impossible, baby. If Roger Bannister can do it, I can do it. <laughs> right? Well, people saw Roger Bannister beat the four-minute mark. Guess what? Nearly 2,000 people have been documented since 1954. It's actually 1,775 documented official race results of people who have run a mile faster than four minutes. Because humans are just getting faster and faster? I don't think so. I think it's because somebody had to do it and say, it's possible. So I'm here to tell you, I was an obese, sugar addict with what I would consider no willpower whatsoever. And if I can stop eating all of those foods, start eating only meat, which I was not a huge meat lover. I was one of those people where I had to drown every steak I ever ate, had to be covered in A1 sauce. I did not even really like meat. I liked burgers with a side of fries, yes. But I was really in it for the drink, the shake, the fries, the bun, the ketchup, the, all of the stuff. And yeah, there happened to be a burger patty on there. To then eating nothing but the burger patties for 10 years, eating meat and eggs now for 15 years. If Kelly Hogan can do it, I'm here to tell you, it is way possible. You can absolutely do this. But it is going to help for you to watch other people succeed, to hear them talk about it, to let your brain know this is not impossible. Third quick story. I joined a group one time. I'm not naming names. Um, it was not even a carnivore group. It was a sugar addiction group. I was already a carnivore, no longer a sugar addict, but I wanted to learn some of the tricks of the trade of how to help people break up with sugar. I knew what I did, but I wanted to learn more. Well, it was a support group. And every time I attended one of their daily chat sessions, the only thing I kept hearing was, well, I ate sugar again today. All of the like confessionals. It was just person after person sharing failure after failure. I know we shouldn't call it a failure, but it was like just all of the Things that they had eaten that they didn't intend to eat and all of their just sugary carb confessional time. That's what it was. And I would leave the meetings and it didn't make me think, wow, we're all out here as a team. We're, we're here and we're all breaking up with sugar together. It was more like, wow, we're just out here failing. And it honestly, I was long recovered from carbs, but it made me almost feel like the norm is to struggle that this is impossible, this is so hard. That's what they kept saying. This is just so hard. It made me believe this is so hard. And it made me want to go grab a bag of chips. I ended up having to leave the group silently. I didn't say any big farewell. I just was like, mm, I've got to quit going to those meetings because it's not teaching me how to succeed. It's just teaching me that most people don't. So now when I run groups, I really want the majority of it to be, hey, Tell us your breakthrough from this week. I want us to focus on that win. Maybe everything this week wasn't a win, but something was. What work did you get done? What, what bubbles did you check off of your list this week? What social situation did you make it through? And maybe it was tough, but how did you do it? I want to know how you are doing it and succeeding. And sometimes that could be labeled as, well, that's just toxic positivity because not everything goes perfectly. Yes. And this is probably the most important thing I want to convey with this video. Hey, I'm going to interrupt my own video. I do want to take a moment to tell you about my coaching groups. We share breakthroughs and struggles, troubleshooting. Every session, you have the opportunity for a Q&A to talk. There are eight separate groups, and the groups are kept to a size where I can communicate with you and talk to you. I always allow people to raise their hand if they have things they want to discuss. You have access to me as well. And a couple other things. One of them is the password protected TDEE, -E, which is a My Zero Carb Life exclusive, where you enter, takes about 30 seconds to enter your information, and it gives you the amount of calories that are recommended for your age, size, and activity level, along with all of that advice regarding protein and fat. Then you also get access for the month of coaching to a 127 page carnivore guide. In addition to that, I post in our private Facebook groups for members only every single day and you have the chance to interact with one another every day as well as myself. I would love to see you there. Thanks.
when things don't go perfectly according to plan and things are hard and perhaps you fell off of that wagon. You know, I don't love that phrase. Why? Because it's your wagon. You're driving your wagon. You're in charge of the wagon. You didn't just fall off of someone else's wagon. But when we make choices that don't align with what we really want for ourselves, we can learn so much from that. And that is how I like for um, a carb confessional to go in the in my groups is like this. Over the weekend, I chose to eat something that is not carnivore. And I want to come here today and tell it to you as my group, as my as my tribe. Why is that important? Because when we speak out loud the truth of what happened about going back to an addiction, it switches our brain from addiction mode, crave, 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 to recovery mode. It happened. It, it's over. It's over. And when we speak it to someone that we trust and we say it out loud, it helps close that chapter and we move on to the next one. So I want my people to do that, but I don't want them to stop there. I don't want to just hear about whatever junk you ate. Now I want to know. So why is that a problem? Why is it a problem? Not just in general, because it's bad for us. No, no, no. What did it do to you? What pain did it cause your body? How did it affect your digestion, your glucose or your ketones if you're tra tracking it? How does that affect your weight in the long run, your A1C in the long run? How did it affect your skin? Did you get a belly ache? Do you have cravings now? Does your steak taste boring and bland? That's what I want to know. The pain it caused. If we focus on the shame of it, why did I do this again? Oh, I do it every single time. We're just confirming it. And it's also painful. Guilt and shame is painful. And it drives people right back to the addiction because they just want to soothe themselves from the pain. But also, we don't want to let ourselves off the hook and say, so I did it. It's not even my fault. Oh, well, no, it hurts your body. So let's dwell on that for a minute, shall we? <laughs> Same as if you bashed your finger with a hammer instead of saying, well, it's fine. I can do that. But it hurt, right? And we don't want to do it again. So then the next step after we've spoken it out loud to people that we trust and we've dwelled on the pain of it, what were the events and situations and feelings that led right up to that moment? Were you at home alone and feeling, I don't know, exhausted, bored, lonely, frustrated? What were you feeling in that moment that that could have been solved with something else. So for example, if we're feeling a real letdown, simply getting out of the house and taking a little walk, talking with a friend, watching something funny, although sometimes watching a screen can trigger this effect, right? So I think it's even better to have a little walk and talk outside, to make that phone call if you don't have anybody nearby to walk with, to just get outside. And it gives us that nice dopamine hit. There are some other ways that we can soothe our bodies even humming. There are some tapping techniques. I will link to some videos below, some little short videos on ways we can self-soothe. But literally, humming helps to trigger the parasympathetic part of our nervous system. Gargling. Yes, literally gargling. Deep chest pats. Like if you were to, like if you were patting a baby's back, and the baby is colicky and upset and you're doing, it's a nice firm pat. It helps to trigger our vagus nerve, which can help turn off the sympathetic side, fight, flight, freeze, and connect us more with our rest and digest, the parasympathetic side. And so doing some of those activities and learning that there are other ways to soothe ourselves in difficult moments other than just food. Because it's actually true, eating does help trigger the more uh, relaxed parasympathetic side. But very often what we're doing is we're eating foods that are processed, which is actually will do the opposite. It keeps us stuck in that fight, flight, freeze. It's toxic. It's junk. And we're doing it while staring at screens, which also registers as stressful to us. So we're eating foods that aren't healthy and looking at screens, usually at night. And it's just, you know, a dumpster fire when it comes to our, our insulin resistance and metabolic health. And we're trying to then heal. So once you have connected with, okay, what was I feeling in that moment? And here's a plan for what I could have done this time and what I plan to do next time. Like 
if you realize I was actually just really hungry and I didn't have any meat on hand. I had skipped breakfast. I'd been chugging coffee all morning. I ate almost nothing for lunch. I got home. I was tired and stressed out and I didn't feel like cooking a steak. I had nothing prepared. So what did I do? I ate my husband's, I don't know, Cheetos, Doritos, whatever. So what can we do next time? What did you know that people who eat a more inadequate breakfast of fat and protein are less likely to binge at night? Kind of makes sense, right? You're front loading your body with the nutrients that it needs. So we're not just dying to sit down and crash at night and just start shoving food in our faces. You might realize, hey, if I packed a, a better lunch to work, then I wouldn't be so over hungry when I get home and making poor choices. If I look for little ways throughout the day to get those little dopamine hits, little moments of joy, if I find some meat that I really enjoy and fuel myself properly throughout the day, I'm less likely to sit down and binge in front of the TV and set yourself up for that success. Have a plan. You can always keep things in the fridge, like the pre-cooked bacon that you can always just grab and go. Hard-boiled eggs, cooked burger patties. So you never have the excuse of, I didn't have anything to eat. I almost always have meat that is cooked and ready. Or like I mentioned in my last video, within 10 minutes, I could have those frozen burger patties cooked in the air fryer and ready to eat. There's never an excuse at my house that I didn't have any meat to eat. Okay, so I'm going to wrap this up and head back out to the beach. But I think the main takeaways for me is just thinking about be careful who we position ourselves next to, whether you're hunting for shark's teeth, trying to quit smoking, or trying to take on a carnivore lifestyle. Find those people who are encouraging, who have been there, done that, who are on the same path. Oh, did you know that if you have five interactions per day, there's research that shows that five interactions per day with people who are also breaking up with the same thing you are. So they're recovering from the same addiction you are trying to recover from, whatever that is. If you interact with five of those people today, each day, you are much more likely to also succeed. So if it were five different Instagram accounts, if it were some videos, if you're in my groups, logging onto the Facebook page, just seeing what other people are doing. When I log on and I see people who post their commitment sheet, what they've eaten today, their breakfast, their lunch, and it's all meat, and they're feeling good, and they're sharing their wins. I'm here to tell you, in a few minutes, I've gotten those five interactions per day where I can hit love, 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 or comment, great job, what a beautiful lunch. And it absolutely fills my brain, my little mirror neurons, the part of my brain that looks at what other people are doing. And I say, wow, it's working for them. I'm going to do that too. It gets them all fired up and it makes this so much easier. Also, let your brain acknowledge this is possible. Don't believe anybody who says it's too hard. We can't break up with sugar because we see all of the cues all day long. It's just too, too hard. It may not be easy. The first couple of weeks might be tough. It's going to be a lot easier if you have some people. And there are some tips on how to make that easier. But ultimately, saying to yourself, it's too hard. It's too hard. I can't do it. No, baby. If I can do it, you can too. And once you've broken free, you never have to go back. I said that to myself many times when it was hard. If I can make it through this once, if I can make it through the withdrawals one time, I'm going to be free from this and I will never go back. And I haven't. I have never been addicted to sugar again. Not once. But if you have tottered back and forth several times, that doesn't mean you're a loser and it's not going to eventually take. It's actually much more normal for people to go back, feel the pain of it, focus on the pain, speak it out loud, realize what was happening in the moment, and make a plan to avoid it next time. All right, the kids are coming in for the beach. Thank you for hanging out with me for a little while. And see you guys next time. Say bye, Annie.